Hello everyone and welcome to the Master Secrets. Today we are here with Doug Swinton. Doug is a Canadian artist up in Alberta and he has got an amazing art store up there and we want to hear more about Doug and more about what Doug is doing. Thank you for being here Doug and welcome. Oh well thank you for having me. Awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. So uh, tell us how you got into art. How did your journey begin? Uh, it didn't begin. It, uh, I, I don't know. That's how long, how much video you got. <laughs> uh, the short answer is I, I can't do anything else but that. Uh, everything else I tried was, was dismal. So I just kept ending up in art. But probably... I, I, you know, a lot of it stems from my mom. My mom painted, my mom had the little Walter Foster books, and I thought my mom was painting and learning how to paint, and she'd take little Chianti bottles of wine, put them on the table with the lemons. Every Wednesday afternoon, she'd paint, and I was probably five years old, and I'd watch her paint. Little did I know that, you know, each painting had successively less wine in the bottle, and I think it was an excuse to drink more than it was to paint. I love it. Tell them the truth, though you know it. Uh, no, my mom she'd drink and she'd paint, and I remember one night my mom would take some art classes in a little town from this other town where we lived. She'd drive all the way in and she'd take these art classes, and she came home one night in a storm, and she'd left the paintings on the roof of the car, and they blew off the roof, and she made my dad go back and look for them, and she was freaking out about it, and I just I sort of remember at that point that. Art was very valuable to her. It didn't matter whether we liked it or not. It was very valuable to her. And I sort of felt bad for her then. And so I think that was the start of my teaching career because I would then help her paint. I was six years old and I'd be like, Mom, those lemons are too blobbly. <laughs> you gotta, you got you to tighten them up, Mom. They don't look like lemons. And little did I know, I'd spend the rest of my life trying to make lemons blobbly because you go through the whole realism thing where it's got to look like a lemon it's got to be tight and my mom kept saying no it doesn't have to be like that it can be like this and I'd argue with her and I'd try and teach her better but ultimately she showed me right you know and she'd have the Walter Foster books and I would watch her paint and so I think uh, there's two two moments in my life that are pertinent to me being an artist the first was moving from a small town in Alberta to the big city to Calgary and when we moved I knew no one. I knew no, had no friends. I was in grade two, and I didn't know what to do. It was the start of summer, and I had no friends. The moving truck was just emptied out, and there was a roll of newsprint in the back that they used to wrap up stuff. And I said to the moving guy, "Hey, could I have a little bit of that newsprint? Could I draw on that? Could I just? Could you tear me some off?" He stuck his head out the truck and he looked around and said, "How strong are you?" And, of course, I'm, you know, I'm seven, eight years old. I'm the strongest kid in the universe. <laughs> he hands me the whole roll, and it had to be, you know, the tail end of a roll. But I carried this roll into the kitchen, laid it out on the floor, and for two months, while I had no friends till school started, I drew on this roll of newsprint. And I kept saying to my mom, I want to be an artist. I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to be an artist. And, and what were you drawing? Anything. I drew a dinosaur, stars, unicorn, I don't know. And I'd, I'd, I'd look out the window... And, and, and you could see at the time it was it was a hockey rink, a hockey arena with this little domey thing. But it looked like a bridge, so I'd draw the cityscape, and then I'd draw this little bridge. And I thought it was a bridge. I didn't realize it was stripes painted on a hockey arena, but it looked like a bridge to me, so what? Anyways, I did that forever. And then, you know, you go through school and you do everything. And then I actually went to art college. And I struggled in art college. I had a huge hard time with it. And I had a huge hard time with the abstractness of it. And they all wanted to be abstract. And I wanted to draw very realistically. And so we didn't get along very well. Anyways, I quit art college and ended up going across the campus to automotives. And I became a car mechanic. And so I got my, light, my ticket as a car mechanic. Was a car mechanic for a while until I realized that I'm working on the bottom of cars with creepers underneath the cars and while I'm under there hiding because I didn't want to come out because they'd make you do more work I was drawing on dirty oil pans and I'd be on my back and I'd be drawing little scenes and I realized then th th this this isn't for me like all I want to do is draw and I realized then again I have to get out of here I have to do art I have to do art so long story longer here I am I'm, I'm in art and I've 
you know, I'm, I've made, I, I've managed to make a living out of art. How did you make that transition, though? How did you make that transition from mechanic to artist? What's uh, that look like? I have no idea. Uh, wow, that's like, I was a mechanic, well, I was a mechanic, and I just, and I wasn't super good at it. I mean, I, I could do it, but I, I wasn't one of these guys, you know, like, you see these TV shows now, and these master mechanics fix everything on a car. I just... I was never that guy. I mean, I could I could do what I was told, and I could fix a car, but I had no passion for it. <sighs> so long ago. I feel so old. <laughs> uh, I don't remember the exact... There's probably... I mean, I could probably go on forever, but at some point, I lost my job as a mechanic, and I didn't have a job. And at the time, I'd just been married. My mother-in-law came to me and said, I know a lady who owns a photo retouching company and this is old school there's no photoshop in these days everything's done by hand and she needs someone to draw on photos to help her correct these photos so it's, it's kind of a bit of a serendipitous thing so I went I had no job and so my mother-in-law tells me to this so you have to do it because you know if your mother-in-law tells you you better do it like yeah. I'm already on sketchy ice as it is so I go to this lady's place I walk in she says to me, oh, can you draw? And I said, I think I can draw. What do you need? She hands me uh, a ripped up photo of an old car and says, can you draw this other part that's missing? And it just happened to be a car, which I could draw. I mean, it was just so lucky that it wasn't something I couldn't draw. So I took the little photo and I drew the headlight on the car. And I, she said, oh, thank you. And she took this out. I'll be back in a minute. And I heard her go back into the other room. And I literally heard her go, oh, my God, did you see this? The dude just drew this. Oh, my God, it's the kid. we got to hire him. We have to hire him right away. Anyway, she hired me. And I spent the next year drawing on old photographs. I drew everything from 1800s, late 1800s photos to 1950s photos. Everyone would bring a photo. And, you know, people would rip up something and take part of something out of a photo to get rid of it. I'd have to redraw it or I'd have to hide the scratch or the tear. I, I actually, at one point, the point I thought I was quitting that job, she got hired to restore the picture of our prime minister, which is like your president, our prime minister. We had 800 photos and he had a little zit on his chin and I had to get rid of them of Brian Mulroney. And I swear to God, if I ever saw that guy again, I was going to punch him just because I'm so <laughs> sick of that zit by the time I was done. I did 800 zits on that man. And he, he, you have to know, he, he had a Jay Leno chin too. It was this big with a big <laughs> zit right on it. Anyways, I worked there for a while and then I ended up sort of transitioning out of that and I ended up working for an art store. And at that point I realized I could probably do this myself and I bought an art store or I opened an art store and I, again... My family. My family's just been a hundred rock behind me. My my ex-wife's family, my family. Everybody was the rock that said, you can do this, you can do this. And I'm like, I can't open my own business. I'm, the, I'm like the last guy on the planet that should have a business. Like, I have no business acumen whatsoever. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, just go. You'll, you'll, you'll do it. You'll do it. They gave me money. The bank gave me money. I thought, in what world does a bank give a guy who doesn't know what he's doing money? Well, they gave me money. Anyways, it's 25 years later, and... Three kids later, and I have an art store and a teaching facility, and I'm painting, and I'm doing this crazy video with you. This is oh, this is awesome. I'm like super proud. So, camera yeah. blushing. Anyways, next question, please. <laughs> That's wonderful, though. And uh, what does it look like being an artist running an art store? Oh yeah, so. The first answer that comes to my mind is, like any other sort of parent who works, I'm torn. So when I'm at work, I think, ah, I should be at home painting. This is crazy. Like, really, my passion is painting. And then I go home and paint, and when I'm at painting, I think, oh, my God, I should be at the store. It's probably falling apart, and they need me, and nobody knows what they're doing there. I need to be there. It's kind of like the parent thing. I'm at work. I should be with my kids. My kids, I should be at work. It's kind of a, lot, a whole lot like that. It's a bit of a juggling act that I've had to juggle the whole thing. Um, my, somebody came to the store a few years ago and brought our yearbook and said, I want to tell you something. I don't know if you know this, but they brought the yearbook. They opened the yearbook up and said, here's your picture in the yearbook. Read what it says. 
and it said under goals and aspirations what you wanted to do with your life my thing said to never wear a tie at work and the guy said i just want you to know you achieved that so you're one of the few in the yearbook that achieved what you wanted i've never worn a tie at any job in my life and so in some sort of weird way i make success that way but i think it's weird you know you're taught not to toot your own horn and to brag about yourself um, and it's taken a very long time for this to come around, but uh, uh, I, 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 you know, I've, I've become successful. I've made it a living out of art. Maybe not just selling paintings, but in some form and fashion, I've created a tribe. I've created a, a world where people can come and do art and paint, and I'm immersed in painting, and my whole life is in art, and I'm making a living at it, and so I'm it's taken a while for me to say this, but I'm kind of proud. I, I, I did that. I did that. And I had a lot, of, a lot of help along the way with multitudes of people. But um, I've, I've been able to do it. And the funny thing about the whole thing, too, is that for a long time, you never own it. You know, oh, you're, oh hey, you got the greatest store ever. Oh, your place is so good. Oh, yeah, whatever. That's good. I know, you know, hey, that's the most beautiful painting. I mean, you're just such a good artist. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Yeah. You know, you, you kind of push it away, and I've been told by a million people, don't ever push that away. People are telling you something, they want, it's like a gift, and you say, here, I'm giving you a gift, and then you go, I don't want your gift, right? That's kind of rude to do, so I had a hard time with that, but this is tooting your own horn. But the weird thing is, when you realize you're successful, and you start owning it and accepting it, more success comes your way, and you get bigger. And it's, it's, it's a crazy weird thing. I, I, I sort of get this feeling, I understand why rock stars own it and why movie stars own it and business people own it. And they go, yeah, I am who I am and I'm successful and there's a reason I am because I know what I'm doing. And yeah, I was always freaked out about going a direction that no one else was going and doing something that no one else was doing because I believed in it when, when you're the only guy out on the trail by yourself. It's kind of freaky. And then you question yourself the whole way, but you still say, I think I know what I'm doing. But now owning it is like it's a whole weird thing. It's a, it's it's new to me. I haven't I haven't done this. So I'm gonna own it for a little while and then I'll just I'll retire and then we'll be fine. <laughs> I'll just go on game out now. But I love that though, Doug. And it's one of the things that um, the starving artist syndrome follows so many artists. They they have a struggle tooting their own horn and keeping humble. Yeah, it's a, it's how do you, how do you how do you say yeah I'm a rock star and I I know what I'm doing and be humble at the same time it's very difficult to sort of double edged thing to follow it's been and I was never one I mean my sister in law uh, when I opened the store bought me a card holder that said a gold card holder from one of those trophy places that said Doug Swinton owner and I was like, oh, I can't put that out. That's like, I mean, okay, here's the thing. Here's how bad it, it was in the beginning. I not only couldn't put the the uh, gold card holder out that said owner, because and I didn't want my name on the do door. I said, no, we're not calling it Swinton's Art Supplies. That's, who does that? And my banker said, uh, the guy who owns McDonald's, the guy who owns Chevrolet, the, everybody in every business that ever was put their name on it because they believed in it. I'm like, oh yeah, but those guys are all good. And he goes, so you think the guy that started Chevrolet, you know, thought that he was going to be as big as he was? And I said, yeah, he probably did because he put his name on it. I said, well, stick your name on it. Okay, I put my name on it, but it freaked me out. Answering the phone with my own name? Oh my God. <laughs> who wants to pick up the phone and say, uh, hello, Swinton's Art Supplies? That's my name. That's dumb. I didn't want that. It was so bad that when I got business cards made, my business card, I don't have one on me, but I could show it to you, says owner, manager, janitor on it. <laughs> I put that on there because I, I said, I am the owner, I am the manager, but I have to be humble. I'm still the janitor. And the funny thing about that is I still am the janitor at work. But probably one of the smartest things I ever did was put that on a card. Every time I give that to somebody, somebody far away will call and go, Hey, I have your business card. You're the janitor, dude. I know you. <laughs> it was like this weird, lucky thing that I did, but it was to be humble. I've always wanted to say, No, I'm still, and well, you know, and as humble as it is, like I said, I'm still the janitor at work. I still have to do that. I know Cam will tell you, You're not the janitor, dude. I do. I clean the washroom still. <laughs> yeah, humble. Yeah. And so, what does it look like? What does your store look like? So when we started out, here's a funny thing. When we started out, I bought, I had, I rented one bay, four thousand square feet. 
one studio, one teacher, and we had an art store that had a rack of oil paints and then a, a like a uh, silk plant and then a rack of watercolors and we put plants in between to kind of fill the thing out because I had no money to buy art supplies. And so we had this store, but we had everything you needed, but we had lots of space. And so uh, we went along with that and it seemed to work for five years we went along. And then uh, the, the businesses in the other bays behind us or beside us they all sort of disappeared and and uh and they they went away and the landlord came to me and said okay we have an opportunity to rent all seven bays beside you to one company but we need your approval because they sell the same thing that you're selling um in a bit of a different vein and we want to talk to you about that so i talked to them and it was th this business at the time was called crafts canada which was just like michael's art supplies and so they had a store in the north. So I went to the store in the north and I walked in there and I looked around. It was all full of silk flowers and crafty beads and, you know, craft stuff. It's great. Michaels and Hobby Lobby and, and Benjamin Franklin, all that kind of stuff. And I'm strictly fine art, strictly fine art. So I looked at it and they said, well, you hold the key to this lease because you signed a lease that said we can't put a like or similar business in any one of these bays in this area. They said, but we'd really like to rent this. And so I said, yes, I think they can come in. And everybody flipped out and said, what are you doing? Why would you put your direct competition right next door to yourself? And I said, they're not direct competition. They are competition because they sell the same thing. But they have no idea what they're doing. The, the part of the art supplies that they sell is probably 1% of their whole business. And out of that 1%, they have no idea what they're doing. They hire people for $5 an hour that don't even know crafts let alone art supplies. I said, if anything's gonna happen, they're gonna look at their prices, they're gonna look at the lack of, of, of knowledge that these people do have, and they're gonna send them over to me. And guess what happened? All day long, they would send people, go, there's an art store at the end, go there, talk to them, they have art supplies. And our business doubled overnight by having them. And while everyone else thought it was death to the store, it was it was such a success they were there for five years till they ended up folding michaels actually came into town and blew them out of the water but they left but for those five years we had r a, just the kind of run i needed to take us to the next level and when they left i rented another bay so i now have 8800 square feet wow so we have 8800 square feet out of which probably 2000 is the store you know, there's some common area and stuff in there, and the rest of it is a teaching facility. And we're running pretty near 600 students a week through there now. Oh, my goodness. Between the kids' classes on the weekends and kids in the evening, and all-day classes, night classes, men, women, adults, children, everything. We're pretty near 600 people a week. So, yeah, it's, like, it's crazy. It's People want to paint. They want to be creative. People are out there going, please, no more TV, no more iPads, no more... Just put something in my hand and make. let me create. Please, please let me do something that involves this. And so you've had a really interesting journey. How do you suggest to other artists that they find this little niche for themselves? How did you go about doing that? I mean, was it just a series of happenstance? Well, I'd love to tell you there's some... There's, kind of the old magic jump, you'll get your wings on the way down. I mean, I did do a whole lot of that, and I've read books now about that going, it's the whole thing, again, is if, if, if I knew what I knew now and was going to do this, I'd never do it. I'd go, like, there's no way you'll make it, no way. I mean, I was naive enough and stupid enough to do it, but the whole key to why I, this all sort of happened was I may have been naive enough and stupid enough, but I was also broke enough. I needed a job. And I'd worked, I'd worked retail, I'd worked at other stores. I don't work for the man, I don't do well. I don't, I don't do well when people, it, it's not so much, you know, uh, that, that I don't like authority. I mean, I'll do what they tell me to do, but when I sit there and go, well, this is dumb, why are you doing it this way? Why don't you do, you can make way more money doing it this way. And the repetition, and I just knew, I just have to do what I do. Right? And I, I can't work for anybody else. You know, I just, I can barely work for myself. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the, the need for money is part of it, but, uh, but, so, I mean, it, 
there's so, you, you ask that question, there's so many directions you could go. So it depends on what you want out of life. It depends on what you want out of art. So at one at one point, I just wanted to be an artist, but I think in the big the big giant picture was I wanted to make money in art. And I at first I thought that would be being an artist, that I, I'm gonna be an artist. But I've realized as time went on that maybe it meant that I'm gonna make money at art in some form or fashion. So I've sold frames, I've sold art supplies, I've teach classes, I paint, I sell in galleries, I've done you know, many irons in the fire, so to speak, that, that make you money. One thing doesn't make me money, but so, and then the other thought that comes to my mind is that I went to art college and I, and I, and I, 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 I was a dismal failure at art college, but part of it was because the art college didn't know what they wanted to do with people. They just sort of taught you some art stuff and, and the art stuff that we learned was very abstract and it had no meaning. It seemed to float and go nowhere. And I think what I wanted to be was an easel artist, meaning I want to paint paintings, put them on an easel, put them in a frame, put them in a gallery and show people what I see, my vision. And art colleges don't a lot of times teach you that, not, not the regular generic uh, public art colleges and universities just are not, I mean, I gotta tell you, I don't, I mean, you can edit this out if you want, but I went to the art store here at the university where we're staying to do this workshop with John Poon. I went there to ask them for a value finder because I needed to use it. And the, the, the girl looked at me and goes, what's a value finder? And I'm like, this is a university level art store that doesn't carry the fundamental thing you need to do art. This is the, the state of our world for art, for teaching. I shook my head. She didn't even know what it was, what I was looking for. They had one at Michael's. I went to Michael's down on the bottom shelf in the corner, had to scrape the dust off of it because they don't know what it is either. But I found a very fundamental tool to paint with. So um, uh, here I am in art college, and I don't think art colleges teach people how to be easel painting artists. I mean, they, they talk about that. They, they teach you how to for lack of a better term, have great verbal masturbation. You know, stand by your painting and go, blah, 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 my mom is mad and my dad drinks too much and I have angst and my life sucks and, and this is why I paint. Well, I get another problem. I love my mom, I love my dad. I came from a great family in a great town in a great city. We weren't rich, but we certainly weren't poor. I love my life. I have zero angst in the world whatsoever. I want to bring joy to the world by painting and showing you what beautiful things can be there. I don't have angst. Art colleges don't like that if you don't have angst. I don't even own a tattoo, okay? I don't even have a tattoo. I'm so unangsty. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Yeah, um, I don't think art colleges are the way to go if you want to be an easel artist. If you want to be an easel artist, you need to find some artists that you admire and, and some things that, that have gone their way and you need to jump on that horse and follow it and see where it takes you. I, I followed a lot of artists and I have a lot of art friends and I've gone down this vein with people that I that I like and it's it's done very well for me. So if you've got 600 students coming through your store a week, that means you have to have some art teachers. You can't handle 15. 600. 15 are, are we have 15 different instructors there between the children's instructors and the adult instructors that are there all different genres between watercolor oil acrylic pen and ink printmaking and all different uh, abstract tight tight as the skin on an apple i got a guy that paints so tight it's crazy but he's so good and my so my whole key is not it's not my whole philosophy to the whole teaching thing was I'm going to do I'm not the first guy to have an art store and have classes there's lots of those out there and lots of people teach all over the place but my thing was given that I got crap at art college okay here let's just sidebar for a sec I go to art college fail dismally I'm looking out the window of the art college across the campus which was connected to a, a technical school a polytech if you will and they have welding and iron working and, and heat and air ventilation and stuff but I could directly see out the window across to an airplane hangar where they're teaching guys how to be air, aircraft mechanics and I'm looking at that as I'm painting going see those guys over there are being taught that A plus B equals C and you've got to do this or the plane will crash 
And I'm like, why in art do they go, oh, A plus B, B never equals C, no matter what, like whatever, you just do whatever and quit asking all these questions, just be creative. And I sort of thought, well, I'm already creative. I came to you to find out what I need, what, what can I do with my creativity? Show me the tools. I got the creativity, now show me the tools. But they didn't do that either. So they're very frustrated thinking lawyers learn this, doctors learn this, but why aren't, where's the art thing? So I quit, became a mechanic, and then I, you know, need the art thing. So I go back to night school, back to the same art college to take a, what they call continuing, continuing education night class, just a little city course. And I end up taking a watercolor course from a guy, and he says to me, oh yeah, blah, 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 when you're painting trees, do this. And I'm like, how do you know that? I've never heard that. And he goes, oh yeah, it's in Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. I'm like, what's that? He says, oh, a book, you gotta go get that book. So I went to the, this is before I owned an art store, I had to pay full retail, went to a local art store. Still burns me a little bit. <laughs> I paid $12 for this book. I read it in two days. Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting, one of the best books ever written. Still, 17 bucks. It's got four years worth of art college in it for $17. I read this book. I was so annoyed after I read that. I wanted to go to my parents and go, go to the art college and get, my, get your money back. Get your money back for this. They didn't teach me anything. Everything's in this book right here. I couldn't believe it. There it was. There was a book. There was a book that actually taught you that A plus B equals C. Now I understand that when you paint A plus B doesn't always equal C, but if your metric is A plus B equals C and you have something to, to, as a standard to measure what you're doing on, that's gonna work. And of course that book led me to Edgar Payne's book, which led me to every other book in the world. And I'm, I tell you, for a guy who went to high school and uh, reading, really, we have to read a book? Like, <laughs> I, I've read, I can't tell you how many, my, whole, I, I gotta, my kids freak out now and go, you've read every one of these books? I said, open every one of them up, you'll see I've underlined everything. I've read every page in every one of those art books. So I learned a ton and realized, oh yeah, education is out there, it's just not in the institutions that it needs, where it needs to be. And I mean, I've taken from a ton of teachers and every one of them, I mean, I, it sounds funny, but I take a yeah, $600 workshop and if I learn one thing that helps me paint better so I can sell one painting for $600 that just paid me back for that education, that's cheaper than any school ever. And I, I'm, I've, I, the stuff I've learned is amazing. What's your philosophy on continuing education, even at your level? Well, it's all, it all depends on what you want out of art. There, like I like I say, I got six hundred students coming through, and some people they don't even care if they ever sell a painting ever. They don't care. They just they come for the social event. Some people come and drink coffee. They don't even paint when they're there. They just need to get out of the house and talk to other people. And if that's what art is for them, then great. That's what art is for them. I've had other people come through there that one of my best friends is now selling in Jackson. I mean, he's doing better than I am, and I helped him along his way, and he's taken off, and, you know, these days I, you know, I should let the air out of his tires, I guess, but, <laughs> eh, whatever. Anyways, no, so, uh, no, he's, he's a good guy, and I'm very proud of him that he's taken off, and our, our store had a little tiny bit to do with that along the way. There's Art to everyone is something different, and not everyone needs to to do what they do to to not everyone needs to I mean not everyone's looking to, to sell paintings and to be a world-class master some people are just there for the sheer creativity of it but I will say this for those of you that want to paint and want to get ahead one of the best things I was taught was by William Reese Bill Reese when he said to me you got to paint three days a week minimum just to keep up 
And I sort of thought, okay, yeah, whatever, like, okay, because I'm working and whatever. But now that I'm uh, I'm on, on a better road for that, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. Three days a week minimum just to keep up if you want to be painting 10,000 hours, that whole thing, all of it. That That's not wrong. That's It takes to be a really good artist. Like John Poon said, you know, you want to get to the next level to get up there, then good enough is not good enough. I, I put that's the first thing I put in my book, John Poon. Good enough is not good enough. You need to, you you want to you want to be Tiger Woods. Good enough is not good enough. There you go, and you just keep going, right? You just got to keep doing it and going and going. See, the problem with the whole thing is, you you can't. You don't get to measure your success every single day and go, oh, today I'm a little better. Oh, today I'm a little better. But you got to measure it over the long haul, saying, man, I was, I used to be down here, but I'm kind of up here now, and I'm kind of up here. Like, you do get better, but the problem with getting better is you want to get better than better and better, and it never ends. I had a guy, Robert F. McGinnis, fantastic Canadian artist, does a lot of, a lot of landscapes, but these crazy quirky figures he does, just beautiful. 60, he turned 60, went to his birthday party. After everyone had left, we're sitting down having a drink together, and he said to me, I, I asked him about a painting that was on the wall, and he said, oh, I did that a couple weeks ago. Do, do you like that? I said, I love that painting. That's fantastic. He goes, I think it's good, too. He goes, I, I don't like a lot of what I do, but I really like that. He goes, you know, I think I'm just starting to get this. I think I'm starting to figure this out. I thought to myself, 60? You've been painting for... 40 years and now you're telling me at 60 you're just starting to get it well that was 20 years ago and i'm i'm like oh, okay now i'm starting to think yeah you know what learning never ends it never ends yeah you'll never get it you'll never get it. it and and the whole thing is elusive anyways i mean it's there one day and gone the next day i mean you could ride the wave and have three good paintings and the next day everything should go in the fireplace and heat your house with it so that that'll <laughs> never that'll never end that <laughs> That's the elusive thing. You just you f you flirt with it, and and you get to get used to flirting with it. And you know that's a funny thing is because people think that once you achieve this level of artistic skill and creativity, that everything that comes off your easel is a masterpiece. Ah, dude, no, I, I call I call that the Fleetwood Mac syndrome. I like Fleetwood Mac. Great band. But, you know, if you want to really talk about Fleetwood Mac, they've been around since 1964 or 65 was when they first came out. When they were with Peter Green, they were a hardcore blues band, and they've had many transitions through everything they've done. And they're still out there. And Mick Fleetwood is still the drummer, and he's still going at it. I mean, it never ends for him. But, but here's the key to the Fleetwood Mac, what I call a Fleetwood Mac principle, is... You turn on the radio and boom, there's a Fleetwood Mac song on. You Then what do you want to do? You want to now, I guess, download, but in my day, you'd go to buy the Fleetwood Mac's greatest hits. And here's 14 songs that they have. And you're like, God, man, these are good. Every song is good. But you, 1965, they started. you got 14 songs from 65 till now. That's not a lot of songs, you know, but... You're always only listening to the best of the best. They got another 25, 30 songs that are really good, but every album, two songs are good, the rest are filler. You know, like not everything that you do is good, but you buy this best of thing and, and then you go, well, Fleetwood Mac, all they ever do is good stuff. It's like buying an art book. You look at an art book, what's in it? Fantastic paintings, but that's all you ever see is the good stuff. They don't show you the crap. I am. I'm going to write an art book. And I'm going to put out, here's my top 100 worst paintings I ever did. And I'm going to sell that <laughs> book. Because no one does that. And people need to see the crap. I have crap in my, my studio right now. You have no idea how much crap that's in there. But you got to throw enough spaghetti at the wall. Something's going to stick. You do get better. Your success has come better. But that's the whole thing is you look at an art book. You, 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 you get a best of album. And you think that everything that they do is good. No. We all struggle. Everybody struggles. And, and you read the Mick Fleetwood biography and talk about him between the struggles of his band disappearing all the time and how they sucked and they weren't making any money and he went broke. And then he was a millionaire and then he blew all his money and went broke. And, man, the ups and downs. Everybody's like that. Did he just, it's up and down. It's up and down. You just got to kind of... It's a journey. It's a total journey. It is. And it's always, you know, it's about the journey, not the destination. I don't know where the end of this is. I have no idea. But, um, you know, I think Neil Young always said, I'd rather 
I'd rather take the journey in the ditch than I would on the highway. So it's much more fun and bumpy. So I think I've been in the ditch the whole way. It's been <laughs> bumpy all the way, but I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. It's good. It's, I've met, that's, that's another thing. One of the greatest things too about this whole art thing is I've met a lot of artists and I tell you 99% of everybody I've met is a wonderful person. Yeah. You hear about these are very few artists are pretentious and, and, and snooty and whatever. I mean, I've met a couple of those, but very rare. You meet someone and you think, oh my God, this guy's so famous. He's probably, oh, I'm all embarrassed to meet him. And then you meet him and you know what? They're just regular people that just have worked really hard at what they're doing. They're awesome. They're all, all artists are great. You, everyone, you should, you should buy an artist. Don't buy art. Buy an artist. We should all have an artist at home. They're lovely to have. Oh, I love that. I do. I love that. That's so sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you hear that, people? Buy yeah, an buy an artist. artist. Forget the art. Take an artist home and feed him. <laughs> I, apparently, I don't, I don't start. Okay. <laughs> I'm all right. <laughs> So what is it that you see most artists as their biggest struggle? Well, if you're going to talk about being an artist, but most people just don't paint enough. They don't. I mean, you know, take, I take workshops from people and, and, you know, I don't know what their ultimate goal is, but some of them talk like, well, you know, I really want to be a good artist, but then they take a one workshop a year and that's all they paint. You, you can't do anything five days a year and be good at it. I mean, I don't care if it's washing dishes. You'd suck at washing dishes if you only did them five days a year. Or four, like me. <laughs> if you can get away from it. If you break a dish, they tell you to get out of the kitchen right away. It's a secret. Don't let know. Break a glass, they'll be like, oh, no, no, okay, go, go. You don't do dishes. Um, no, most people don't. I think, I think the, the what a... I'm not sure why it is with art that this doesn't happen, but every sport that you play and a lot of other things that you do, people practice. So, I mean, you know, you want to be a hockey player. Well, even a professional hockey player, they play hockey all the time. But what do they do between games? They practice. They're professionals. Why would they practice? You'd think you'd already be there. You don't need to practice. Oh, no. You have to practice all the time. Basketball players practice. Golf, when people golf, even if they're not professional, what does a golfer do? Well, he goes to the golf course and he says, oh, I'm going to go half an hour early. I'm going to get a little bucket of balls and I'm going to go on the putting green and fart around for a little bit and practice putting. Well, how come piano, everybody, scales. Even the best piano players in the world tell you, I still do scales to warm up. I still practice my stuff. Why is it with art that no one practices art? No one with art says, oh, I'm going to do 35 trees and practice trees till I get a bit of a hang of them. Or I'm going to do 100 skies until I get a feeling for, like I'm starting to feel how the sky thing works. No, everybody hits the canvas and they want to have a finished painting. They want to put it in a frame. They want to sell it. They want to be an artist right away. No one sits and actually practices. Who practices brush strokes? Holding your brush, getting more delicate with your brush, mixing colors. Most people's problems are, are, are they don't paint well because they spend so much time trying to mix a color that they can't figure out how to mix that their brain is so saturated with left brain I'm trying to mix this color they have no time to be creative with it but you should practice go to the paint store and randomly pick out 25 color chips from there take them home mix them up put one on and have a color mix that color get another one mix that color until you get very confident mixing color because as soon as that leaves your brain where you don't have to think about it anymore your brain can be filled up with something else that, that's useful to paint with some of this has to come intuitively to you if you don't I mean painting is like I liken it all the time painting is like flying a jumbo jet you ever see the cockpit of a 747 all those gauges and dials and switches and lights Painting is no different than that. And every one of those things, they, the pilot knows what it's for and what it's telling him. But you get to painting and like, how do I hold my brush? And what direction do I hold it? How much paint? How thick? How thin? What color? Is it, is it, am I in the right value? Am I in the right color? Is it too warm? Too cool? There is so much shit to learn when you're painting that if you don't get some of this to become second nature, there's no time for creativity. Creativity will not come in until all is quiet and everything's quiet. If the left brain's yelling at you, hey, what are you doing here? And oh, you should put more, and oh my God, I think your tree's not right. You, you, can't, just, you can't be doing that. You gotta be all quiet and calm 
so that the left brain will come in, or the right brain gets to come in and be creative. It's, it's got to be quiet. The, 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 the right brain is very shy. She doesn't want to come in until that left brain shuts up. And so what are some good exercises that you can think of that can really help quiet the left side of the brain and elevate the right side? I, I think my, my two, the, the two that I, the, well, the th there's three things that I do with my students that I think have really, really helped. One is the old value exercise and trying to put a, pay, put a photo up in black and white and make them paint in black and white so they get used to your values. Get used to that value chart so that you know I'm in a value two, I'm in a value five. Um, that's, I mean, we see in black and white before we see in color, so if you can get your values down and every book you read, every artist says, oh yeah, value, value is the most important thing. It is. If you can get that done, then the color shift, get used to mixing color. If you can mix your colors and get used to mixing colors so that they become second nature, that you look at something. 50% I mean, of mixing color is, an, is in identifying a color. Most people can't even identify the color that they're looking at enough to be able to mix it. They don't even know what color it is. They can't tell you what it is to mix it. And if you can get used to that, then mix the color, it's great. But the third most important one is you need, this is going to be contrary to a lot of what people say, but you need to paint fast, as fast as you can. So I do this exercise where we, I do a class where we paint 25 paintings in two and a half days. Wow. Yeah, so you have 20 minutes to paint a painting, five minutes to clean your palette, and the next, I put slides up. Here's a slide. You got 20 minutes. Paint it. Next slide's coming. I don't care if you're finished. I don't care if you barely started. I don't care. We do two and a half days, and by the end, you're going to have 25 things. And I can just, so what happens is, people paint so fast, the left brain, what it does is, it goes, oh, you're, you're, oh, oh, wait, no, okay, okay, color, okay, you're gonna, oh, no, no, you're painting, through, oh, oh, no, the left brain, it's going so fast, it can't even ask the question to figure out what's going on, the right brain's just going, shut up, I'm painting, I'm painting, <laughs> and it just goes along, and you'd be amazed at what people get at the end of this, they're painting paintings that they thought they could never paint in 20 minutes, it's, that's awesome, it, it's great, and People start out and you, you do 20 minutes. In the, the Friday night, they'll be like, the little beeper will go beep, beep, beep. And they'll be like, what? That's not 25 minutes. There's no way. That was like, no way, no way. By the Sunday afternoon, at the end, they're setting their brushes down, going like this. Beep, 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 beep. And they'll go off. They know exactly what 20 minutes is. And they know exactly how long. And people are going, can we do 10 minutes? Could we do 15? Could we do them quicker? It's, it's amazing that how fast you can bang that stuff out and get the basis for a painting done in 20 minutes. I hope you take it home now, play with it all you want. The structure that you get in 20 minutes is the basis for all paintings. You know, it, it's really, that timer thing is something that really, really does work. I've been in workshops where the model is setting and you're just really whacking it out and you're getting towards the end. You know that you've got one more 20, 25 minute setting and you've got to get this painting finished or to a degree of finish that you'll be able to take absolutely, it home. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's amazing. I can only be halfway done and that last setting, I mean, I am fast and furious slapping that paint on there and that's the best work of the whole portrait. Isn't it the loosest, craziest, most <laughs> creative stuff that you did yeah when the when the left brain is chasing the right brain stuff happens that's the zone where stuff happens i love that i i love your idea of uh quieting the left brain down and the way that you do that is just one well, there's and the left brain has two people in there there there's the analytical dude that's always asking you going hey you know what about this tree? Is it the right shape? Is it the right color? Is it? Is it? Are, are you doing? How much paint do you have? And and then he's the same guy that says, oh, "We having pork chops for supper?" And off thinking about something completely different. But there's another dude inside the left brain, and that's the you suck. This is terrible. You're the worst artist ever. You gotta shut that guy up right now because he just get him away. Go away. I don't need you. That, that's got to go away. That self-doubt and self-deprecation that every one of us lives with, if you can get that creative brain working, that doesn't that goes away right now. The left, that, that annoying guy, he'll go away really fast, and he'll be so excited with what you painted. 
And earlier today we heard someone espouse that exact sentiment. How is it when you hear someone saying that, that you're able to squelch that that voice that has now become audible and is now spreading throughout the classroom? There, there, yeah, well, there's that. But there, that's, that's the old double-edged sword, too. Uh, how do you squelch the guy that says, I suck, I suck, I suck, and still live the, well, I want to get better, and that's not my best work, and I need to do better than that, and I should wipe that off because it's not good. You can't just go, well, I don't suck, and everything I do is good. You can't live on that side, and you can't live on the I suck side either. You got to run that fine line. But as you were saying, the guy that came in and said, oh, no, I suck, I suck. You can't go around all day long telling yourself you suck or that you're not good or that was a piece of crap and I'll, I'll do better next time, but that's crap. You can't keep telling yourself that day in and day out without it affecting you somewhere. There's just no possible way. You hear that? I mean, I mean you, you, you heard him say, he says he sucks. Well, I don't really believe that I suck. I'm like, I know you don't really believe that, but I don't believe I suck either. But if I got a person telling me for five years, every single day that I suck, at some point, I think I'm gonna to start to believe it. That's not healthy, that's not good. No, you don't suck. You're gonna be better next time and you're learning and you're getting better, but you do not suck. Dude, oh, that's horrible, don't, no, be, be happy, be happy. <laughs> I don't know, be happy, be, be, I don't know, you, don't don't tell yourself you suck. You don't suck. You you have bad days. You have good paintings. You have bad paintings. Some paintings do need to be wiped off. But that doesn't mean you suck. It just means you're getting better and the learning is there. And then part of learning is putting a Band-Aid on your knee when you fall. I mean, children, when they learn to, to walk, they don't walk right away and get up and run. They fall a lot and hit their head on the coffee table. And then you put a, a pool noodle on the corner of the coffee table. <laughs> right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you say to him though you said something to him well I told him that you can't say that you, you... yeah but you said because he, here's the funny thing he is a philosopher and of all the things that guy should know is that and then you said oh, I said that what you think is your reality yeah what, exactly what you think is your reality if you tell yourself you suck you're gonna suck yeah like the body's gonna do what the mind tells it to and if, yeah that's yeah. that was gold what you yeah. said yeah yeah, well, it, you know, what we do tell ourselves is our reality, you know, and even though something else can be happening that is in complete opposition to what's going on in our brain, we don't see it. All we do is see the message that's going on in our own brain. Uh, yeah. And it's when we start telling ourselves good things that things start to change. Well, as I said, once I started believing in myself more, the snowball effect was was huge. Somebody's gonna watch this video that knows me and go, "What are you talking about? You tell yourself you suck every single day, and I <laughs> suck at this and I suck at that." And I did used to do that. I no longer do that because I've learned better. And it was a hard hard thing to do because I I am the hardest on myself. People would say to me all the time, "Man, you're hard on yourself." It's like really, cut yourself some slack. You're a good artist. But I kept saying, "Well, yeah, this is." you know, good for me here, but I want to be here, so it still sucks. And and, and I learned, no, you can't, no, that's bad. You can't do that. Yeah. yeah, I'm not where I want to be, but this doesn't suck. For where I am, this is fantastic. This is, and I do pat myself on the back a little bit more now, and it's much, much better. Well, you know, Michelangelo, uh, at 89, when asked, you know, what his, his thoughts on, on art were, he said, I'm still learning. At 89, At Michelangelo, 89. you know? Uh, I mean... Absolutely, yeah. So for us to know that we'll never... You know, should always be learning. Always. 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 If you're not learning, you're stagnant pond scum. <laughs> That's kind of harsh. I shouldn't have said that. You're stagnant water if you're not learning. I'm leaving the whole thing in there. <laughs> I'm Same telling you. Scum. You're pond scum. <laughs> I like it. I, I do. I like it. Because uh, how, because you being a business owner, putting your name on your business, 
it had to be really uncomfortable for you. It was huge. That was crazy. Like I've, I'm an only child. I don't know if that's a whole thing. Some people tell you, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, you have you have issues or whatever. I don't know. But I'm I'm an only child. Whatever. I didn't have brothers or sisters or anything to bounce anything off of. But putting and seeing my, I was. Uh, not just even just recently you know being proud that my name is on the door like that was that's tough man that's like weird that's creepy weird i grew up with two parents that were like you don't toot your own horn you don't be a braggart ever and and i was never you know and i and even though in kindergarten the first thing i do is run home and stick my pictures on the fridge <laughs> they made the fridge yeah if they stayed up for a couple of days that meant mom liked them and my dad would take them down and shake his head i don't think he you know it's funny i'll tell you a little story though uh, my dad was an engineer mechanical and chemical engineer and not the most artistic guy in the in the entire world but uh I struggled in school an awful lot. Never got great grades. I had a little bit of an ADD problem. Some of it's some of it's ADD. Some of it's very typical Tom Sawyer boy thing. I'd rather be out with a slingshot shooting cans with rocks than I would be in school. I mean, I think that's just typical of a lot of boys, anyways. But I do I do have some ADD problems that I've that I've been able to manage. And my dad was Mr. Scientist, Mr. Rock Solid, go to university, straight A's. And I got horrible marks in school, and I skipped school, and I'd get in trouble. I was in trouble all the time, and he'd shake his head constantly at me. Um, and then when I got into high school, I, the first thing I did when we got options was I took drafting. I thought, you know, I kind of am artistic, um, and I like drawing, so I'll take drafting, and I'll become an architect, and I'll just draw cool houses, and I'll be Frank Lloyd, even writer, <laughs> and. So I took drafting, and my first report card came back, I had about 40%. My second report card came back, 35 My third report card came back, and I had 20%. I was skipping now and not going to class. I didn't understand any of it. You had to sharpen your pencil. It had to be the perfect line. There was no creativity in it whatsoever. Anyways, I brought my report card home, and it dragged my mark down so much, I gave it to my mom. And my mom looked at it and said, oi boy. She said, I don't know what we're going to do here. She goes, I'm not sure what your father's going to say when he sees this. And she said, but I'm going to leave it up to him. And I mean, my parents are old school, right? Dad rules the roost. He's the, you know, got his pants up here. Talk to you, buddy. And all that kind of stuff. And he used to freak me out because wait till your father gets home. and be like, ah. Anyways, my dad came home and my mom gave him the report card. And my dad said, sit down, son, I want to talk to you about your report card. And I'm like, oh, God, here we go. I'm going to be a homeless person any now, anytime now. My dad says, I got, I, I got a question for you. What's with our, uh, uh, drafting? What's with 20% in drafting? What's with that? And I said, well, I skipped a few classes, and I'm not sure I understand it. And he said, no, I want to ask you, like, what's with it? Why drafting? Why are you in drafting? He says, you have 90% in art and 20% in drafting. Why did you take drafting? I go, oh, because I don't know, you're kind of an engineer and you have the little drafting thing and I thought maybe you could help me and I could be an architect. He laughed and said, why would you take drafting? He said, you you couldn't draft if, if your life depended on it. Why are you taking drafting? And I said, I told you, I just, whatever. He goes, okay, you don't take drafting anymore. He goes, why are you not doing more art? And I said, well, I said, well, one day you said to your buddy when he was over, going, I don't know, my son, whatever, he's already farty. That's what he does, already farty stuff. He goes, well, yeah, he said, already farty, because you are already farty. And I said, well, he goes, I would, I would give my left nut to be as artistic as you are. I'm not allowed to be artistic. I'm in a world that does, that forbids any artistic beings whatsoever. We're strict and square. And he said to me, you know that draftsmen must draw a straight line. He goes, the wonderful thing about art is you get to draw a line and then put everything around that line to make it perceived to be straight even though it's not straight. He goes, what a wonderful world you live in. Why aren't you doing art? I was shocked. I thought I was going to be homeless. And he basically said, I'd give my left nut to be as artistic as you are. That gave me free reign to become an artist. 
and then so you know the whole long journey thing whatever and it, I struggled with it too and whatever but but my parents never then stopped me from doing anything they bought me guitars they bought me drums they bought me anything I wanted to be artistic yeah make him take put him in drama lessons put him in guitar right? he's artistic he'll do some that's wonderful yeah they were very they're very super supportive that way for an engineer but he still used to shake his head still still long hair you know and now the funny thing is I have long hair my kids have high and tight short hair and I keep looking at him and going, what's with the hair, dude? Get, grow your hair like a normal human, would you? My dad used to be, let's go to the barber. I'm, oh, he just want to grab my hair and cut it off. My son um, is one of those kids got a great head of hair, right? But he's got a buzz cut all the time. When he was like 10, 11 years old, I offered him 100 bucks. I said, dude, 100 bucks. Just grow, grow your, your hair. hair. Yeah. <laughs> no. I had short hair. Well, I had long hair in school, but uh, I had, as I grew older, it got shorter, and I had regular coiffed hair. And then, and then I don't know what happened. I grew a little bit longer, and somebody said to me, I said, oh, I know my hair's too long. i got to get a cut. And they said, if you can grow hair like that, grow it as long and as much as you can, because it is going to fall out one day, but you do it while you can. So the last 10 years, my hair has gotten incredibly long, and I'm like, whatever. I'll... It's my opinion that a young man need not have long hair because they're young, right? They're, they just look, you know, they have that youth about them. I think that older men look better with more hair on their head. Longer, not just. I, I'm not talking about. Yeah, no, I just I'm want, talking like, about. Yeah, you, you know, you can longer. grow some hair. Yeah. I, don't, I grow like yeah, I don't know. Now I go to the hairdresser and they grab my hair. Go, oh my god, you have the greatest hair. You and do whatever. I'm like, oh, you do have the greatest. It's, hair. I'm going to use it while I can because someday it's going to be gone. So mm, I, I hope not for you. So well, I look at Billy Connolly, the the Scottish comedian. He is. I think he turned seventy this year. And he's got a head of hair that dude. And I was like, oh, that's cool, man. That's yeah, right, yeah. And, and you'll be like that too. Yeah, maybe I won't be that funny, but well, that's all right. <laughs> well, I don't know. Thank you, super. Thank you for uh, this. Is I've never been interviewed before. This is kind of cool. I feel like all right. Come on, Jay Leno. Let's do it next. I'm moving up. No, I'm just kidding, Mel. No, this is thank. Thank you so much. This is I don't know. It's, I used to never want to talk about what I've done and where I am, but I'm kind of proud of where I am now. I, I don't mind talking about it now. It's kind of yeah. It's a bit of a right. It's good. It's, Thank it's you. been a journey, and I'm 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 only halfway there. So, awesome. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much, Doug. All right. You're amazing. Sweet. <laughs> thank you. Bye, world. <laughs>